Hey, good morning, church. Hope you guys have had a great service today. Pastor Brian here. Unfortunately, I'm not with you guys today, taking another week with my family to do some, some rest and relaxation, but we are continuing our Summer Vibes series today. Hope you guys got your shorts and flip-flops on. Hope you guys are feeling the Summer Vibes as well. Hey, we, we have a special guest speaker with us today. I wanna to introduce you to someone, uh, a friend of mine up in Hernando County, uh, Paul Castelli. He has a huge church, uh, amazing things they're doing. Paul and I have been friends for years, and he recommended his uh, one of the, the people on his teaching team. Uh, she's also their student ministry pastor there. Her name is Kimberly Curtis, and we are very blessed and fortunate to have her with us today. She is an amazingly talented communicator. She has a passion for ministry, and let me tell you where that ministry begins. It begins at home for her. She and her husband, John, have six boys ranging in ages from 12 to 22 years, I think she told me. So, so we're, we're so excited today. She's never spoken here before. It's the Sun Coast. I want you to show her how we show honor to people when they come and speak on our stage. I want you to get on your feet right now. Come on, get on your feet and put your hands together. Come on, put your hands together and help me welcome Kimberly Curtis to the Sun Coast today. Dude, let me tell you, this church, you guys surprised me a little. I'm not going to lie. I walked in. I'm like, all right, it's kind of, you know, small. It's a cool space, but man, you guys are small but mighty. Like, the spirit was in here loud this morning, and you guys are like, we're going to yell back. We're going to yell back. God, we can hear you here. We can feel you here. And we want you to know that we're going to yell back till the heavens here. So thank you guys for letting me and my family be a part of worship with you this morning. I don't know if you guys noticed my crew. I did drag them down here. Um, well, five of my boys. My oldest is stationed out of state. Um, so I brought my husband and my other kiddos here with me today to support me. And I'm not going to lie. They all were annoyed because they wanted to serve at church today, um, which is a cool thing until I'm like, can you just come support mom? Because that would be fun. Like that, that would be a nice thing. So they all gave me a hard time, but they're here and they are glad they're here. And I'm excited to have my own little cheering squad that follows me wherever I go. So, so as I was chatting with Pastor Brian about what you guys are doing here, he was like, you know what, just do whatever you want. And I went, oh, clearly you don't know me as well as you think you do. Because otherwise you would never say that. Uh, but being summertime, there were a couple of different things that we batted around um, and that we kicked around. And I chatted with Pastor Paul about and was like, okay, well, what's the thing, right? What's the thing? And I'm like, I don't know, because let's be real. It's Sunday and I love to worship. But if it was Saturday, I'd be at the beach. Like, that's just me. I live at the pool. I live at the beach. You know, when I moved to Florida, we've been down here um, 15, 16 years now. And like, you know, we'd see the tags on people's car, like salt life. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, these are all, it's all fishermen here. Like, it's all people who fit. Like, I, I don't fish. I, I, I've tried. <laughs> I don't catch things. Uh, my oldest son catches blowfish. Um, <laughs> but I don't catch things. And so I couldn't quite understand it. And then now that we've been here a little bit longer, what I know is, like, salt life is, like, it's a way of life, right? It's not just we go to the beach. It's not just we live in Florida. We're stronger. It's, like, it's a whole vibe, right? It's a whole way we do things. My mom will come and visit. She's up in Virginia, and she's like, I don't know what it is about Florida. It's just like, it's, it's a vibe, right? It's a place. And so, but salt life, as Christians, we're called to be what? We're called to be the salt. And so what if, as Christians, we kind of took that mindset of, of the salt life? As Floridians, we have the salt life, and we just kind of said, you know what? Being a Christian, it's about following Jesus and growing my faith, but really, it's, it's a whole vibe right? It's a whole vibe. It's not just what I do on Sunday morning. It's not just where I serve or how I serve. <clears throat> My children who are here not serving, it's not just about that, even though that is super important because those are the things that grow our faith, right? Those are the things that can grow us spiritually. It's not just about my quali quiet time. It's not just about those habits that I have. It's a whole vibe. Me being the salt of the earth is a whole vibe. You know, we look in Matthew 5.13. I think we might have it on the screens. Look at you guys are so awesome. Thank you. Uh, we pick up in Matthew 5, and this is Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount. And so he's talking to um, a group of people, and he's explaining to them, you know, pr previous to this verse, he actually says, like, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, or those who hunger or thirst, right? Blessed are all these people. So he's kind of laying out what it looks like to be a follower. And some of these things are not things that we love, right? Blessed are those who mourn and grieve. 
Blessed are those who meek. I mean, I don't know. You guys have known me three minutes. Do I seem meek? Right? It's not necessarily things that we would strive to be, but God says, man, but I will fill you in this space. I will fill you in this place. And so when he gets to verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. But suppose the salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. It'll be thrown out. People will walk all over it. You are the salt of the earth. Let me tell you, the people he's talking to are not necessarily the most um, educated people. We know that when Jesus spoke, he would use terms and phrases and things to help them to understand a little bit better. And in this time, this is something that they would understand. So these are fishermen. So they understand that salt is a preservative, right? Salt helps to stop decay. Salt helps things to not go bad, or it slows that process, right? So if we are the salt, and we're helping to slow that process, and stop the process of decay, then sometimes we can get in this mindset where we think we we can only do that if we are a certain way. It's really easy, really easy, as a follower of God. And even easier, I can tell you, as a leader in a position of followers of God, which we all are because we're all called to lead others in kingdom ways, right? It's really easy to disqualify ourselves based on our accreditation. It's really easy to say, but I haven't served enough. I haven't spent enough time. I sinned. I fell short over here. I am not qualified to walk in this way that Jesus calls me. But what he's saying here is, you are the salt. And here's what I know. It doesn't matter what I say of myself. It doesn't matter what I think of myself. It doesn't even matter what I know of myself. What I know is, if Jesus says, I am the salt, then guess what I am? The salt. And I am called to walk in that space. I am called to represent him because that's what he says that I am designed and created to do, regardless of where I fall short, regardless of where I don't stand up to my own standards. I just had a conversation with my own son in the lobby a few minutes ago about expectations and and standards two minutes ago, ten minutes ago. And I said, right, but their standards don't change mine. So you see, I walk personally as somebody with very high standards of myself and others. So it's very easy for me personally to see where I fall short. But when I go back to the word, Jesus says, Kimberly, you're going to fall short. Kimberly, you're going to mess up. Kimberly, you're not uncalled from being my follower because you fell short of your standards. Because I say that you are the salt, and what Jesus says is you cannot, you cannot by praying enough, you cannot by being in the word enough, you cannot by serving enough or doing enough good deeds, you cannot earn who you already are. You simply are. So let's start right there, because you cannot earn who you already are. If Jesus says, I am, then guess what? I am. So now what do we do with that? What do we do with that? If we're the salt, if we're called to be the salt, what does that look like? So I like things to be um, practical. I have six kids. I have six boys, actually. I have six boys. So there's nothing in my life that does not have a system, right? Right? I need a system. I need steps. Boy, they're, they're a little bit older now. Like Pastor Brian told you, they're, the youngest is 12, the oldest is 22. But when I was younger, when they were younger, when I was younger then too, <laughs> when we were younger, my life, I learned very quickly, it ran on systems, right? Because you can want a great family. You can want great communication. You can want great quality time. You can want great fun. But unless I'm putting the action steps with that, then I'm probably not going to achieve my goal. Or if I get there, it's probably just luck of the draw. So when we put systems in place, we are going to make it easier for ourselves to get to that goal. And so the same thing happens 
in our faith. So yes, Jesus says, I am the salt. I cannot define myself because he says, this is who I am. So for me, what does that look like? What does it look like to be the salt? And let me just tell you, we're, we're influencers regardless of the season we're in. And so salt is called to impact other things, okay? So salt impacts what's around us, whether it's stopping decay or adding flavor. Salt adds to other things. And it doesn't matter what season of life you're in, what your economic status is, what your social status is. We are all influencers in some way. So salt, one of the first things it does is creates a thirst right? You guys eat salty foods, and, and the first thing that happens is like, where's my water, right? I'm big on pretzels or, or Pringles at the beach, right? Where's the water? Salt creates a thirst. Where are we creating a thirst in others for Jesus? How are we using our influence to create a thirst in others to live the kingdom life? What does that look like? You know, with our kids, it's really easy to create a thirst, right? You sign them up for baseball, you take them to practice, they work all season. What do they want at the end? They want the trophy, right? We, we push them all season for a goal. They want a trophy. When we want our kids to, to get chores done and things at home, we put the system in place and maybe we give them an allowance or, or we give them the prize at the end. We create a thirst in our kids. It's not bribery. It's good parenting. <laughs> we create a thirst in our kids. We create a thirst. But where we create a thirst for, for things or for experiences or, or for rewards. So where in our influence, because we don't just influence our kids, right? We influence our coworkers. We influence our neighbors. I thought of that recently. I don't actually know a lot of my neighbors. And I realized, like, but that doesn't mean I'm not influencing them. That doesn't mean the way I carry myself when I walk in or out of the house or if I speak or not when I'm in the backyard and arguing with my kids, it doesn't mean I'm not influencing them with my behavior just because I'm not besties with them. At some level, I'm influencing all of the people around me and what they see, what is it causing them to desire? So if there's a decay in society that we are called as salt to stop, then what are we doing actively to stop that? Because we all agree that there's a decay happening. We all agree. I mean, I'm not super, super seasoned, but I'm seasoned enough. <laughs> I've seen a few things. I've seen a few changes in life and in the world and in society, just the difference between how I was raised and even how my older kids are being raised versus my younger kids and the things that I have to deal with with them. And the number one societal decay when I'm reading this passage and I'm working through it in prayer, is that there's a decay in society of our first and foremost commands to love one another just as I've loved you. So how do we create a thirst that leads people towards the one who is the healer, the one who is the redeemer, the one who actually can fill them for every one of their needs. It's simple. We love one another. Just as he loved us. Not because they deserve it. Not because they have time. Because I will tell you about time. I don't have it. Neither do any of you though, right? But Jesus says, love one another just as I've loved you. And, and you know, sometimes we do that prayer and we say, God, I know you're busy, but. So if we expect the expect, accept exception, then shouldn't we give the exception to those we're called to love around us? The other thing that salt does is when it creates this thirst, we create a thirst based on not our perfection, not our behaviors, not our attitudes. We create a thirst based on authentic love and authentic grace in John 7:38. We pick up, and we read, Does anyone believe in me? Then just as scriptures say, rivers of living water will flow from inside of them. Rivers of living water will flow from inside of them. What was the lyric to the song 
we just sang. The lyric to the song we just sang at the very end said there will be a river, right? We sang these songs, and do we believe the lyrics that we're singing? Do we believe the words that we're singing? We know there is a God that as believers, as followers, he lives in us. The living water is the one that quenches the thirst. We do, we do good deeds. We do acts. We're kind to people. I know you guys do for Pasco, which I love. We actually at Crosspoint do for Hernando, so I'm pretty familiar with it. But the cool thing about this is, is in teaching the people that we lead up there and, and the groups that come out to serve, man, it's really, really cool that we get to go do these things. So we'll do like for Hernando days where we do project days and service days and things like that. But the important thing about what you're doing isn't the act of what you're doing. The act of what you're doing helps people let down their walls a little bit. But the act of what you're doing is to point them towards Jesus. Because I don't need the credit for painting that wall. People need to know that I took the time because Jesus said, Kimberly, love one another, go take the time. That's where I point people towards Jesus because the living water that lives in me, that pushes me, that I lean into to go do kind things, to go do loving things, isn't of me. It's of God. The other thing salt does is it brings out flavor. It brings out flavor. You see, as we talked about in the beginning, who we are can't be based on who we think we are. It has to be who God says we are. And I will tell you, although I don't have to tell you, this world lives in a space that is, they are longing for authentic love. They are longing for authentic grace. They are longing for a truth that will set them free from the binds of this world, from the binds of society. When we bring out the flavor of what God has said we are and who God has said we are in others, guys, the power of our words, our words never do nothing, right? Our words never do nothing. Our words always either bring life or tear down. We have a saying at Crosspoint, we say, leadership and guidance, feedback should always be a ladder, not a hammer. Because we know that if I feed into you with my words, something is going to happen there. Something. You're either going to walk away and maybe brush me off and feel sort of neutral. Or you're going to walk away lifted up. Or you're going to walk away going, and that's why we don't give Kimberly a microphone. But our words have the ability to bring out in people who God says that they are called to be. Think of the person that you know that is furthest from God. Think of that person in your life. You know who they are. I guarantee you as soon as I said it, there was a name, there was a face, there was somebody who popped in your head, even if it was the guy that just cut you off on the way to church. That person is still, still a son or daughter of the king most high. So what if we used our influence, the influence that we have, whether it's big or small, what if we took the opportunity to use that influence to build that person up to bring out the flavor of who God says they are? Man, have you ever stopped and talked to someone, and, and I do it on occasion, and it catches me off guard because I have to be super intentional when I do it, but it always catches, catches them off guard when I say, you know, it really, really, did you see the person's response when you spoke that to them? Do you know how I feel when I see you do that? I had somebody last week who came up to me to tell me um, about the way my child was serving in a ministry. And there's something as a mom that's like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad they're good for other people. They're good kids. <laughs> They're good kids, but it's, you have that moment. But then really my response to them was, but thank you so much for taking a moment to let me know. Because I do appreciate the appreciation of my kids, and I do appreciate them lifting them up to me. I also know that they had already gone and said that to my child. So they need to know in that moment, I appreciate that in you. 
it was one sentence that I was able to say, and they went, oh, yeah, of course, and walked away. It, it's, it's our ability to bring out the flavor of who God says they are. Not focus on the negative and not even just not acknowledge the positive. We take a moment to just bring them up and say, hey, this is who I know you are, so I'm going to treat you as such. Because God says that you are this person, and if I am salt, then I am called to bring out the flavor of who God says you are. When we use our words intentionally, we're leaning into our call, to our command, to be the salt of the world. Salt changes what it touches. Salt changes what it touches. You know, you guys go to the beach, and I'm not big on um, the water even. Like, I will. Actually, usually we'll drive over to, like, Daytona or Cocoa, somewhere on the East Coast, because my kids like the waves, because they, their kids, they just want to be in the water. Husband, too. Just wants to be in the water. I'm not necessarily that guy. I'd rather lay in the sand and, you know, just chill in the sun and, and watch them play and play some and eat lots and lots of stuff. But even as I sit on the sand, you can feel your skin get dry, right? Yes, from the sun and from the sand, but we, we know it's from the salt in the air, right? As soon as you roll your windows down when you get close to the water, you know that you're in the salt. You know that you're in the salt air because you can feel the difference. You can smell the difference in the air. You can feel it dry out your skin. Ladies, it'll make your hair kind of like crunchy, right? Salt changes what it touches. Whether you get a little bit of it because you're laying on the beach, or you get a lot of it because you're face first in the water, salt changes what it touches. You see, Christianity was never meant to be, never, meant to be a subculture of the world. So society says we should behave one way. Christianity says we should behave another way. And oftentimes as followers, we fall into the rut of saying, fine, I'll be a Christian where it fits in society. But you see, we are not called to be of this world, simply in it. But while we are in it, we are called to change it. You see, in the world, there's this thing that's happening I think it's more prevalent, although that could just be as I'm getting more seasoned. That where people think that if I disagree with them, I I don't like them. If people think I I don't um, agree with their behaviors, their attitudes, their actions, their habits, their hang-ups, and I'm okay with voicing that, then I don't like them. Worse yet, that I don't love them. And as a Christian, I'm called to love, and I've sat in an office over and over and over where people say, you're called to love me, how dare you not love me just because I fill in the blank. And I as a Christian in understanding that I am salt and called to stand apart and make a difference in the things I touch have to be able to look at them in the face and say, disagreeing with you does not change how hard I love you. But I am called to not stand aside and watch society decay. I am called to not just stand back and be a part of this space until I get to the heaven that I've been promised. I am called to change what I am in and bring everybody along with me. So you see, salt changes what it touches. So it's okay if we love people wholeheartedly and disagree with them wholeheartedly. Just check yourself and make sure it's coming from a place of love because that's a real easy line to walk between uh, love and judgment, right? Not going to lie. We're going to be a little bit honest here. There's only a few of you, so don't call me out too hard on social media. But we are called to change what we touch. And if Jesus says, I am salt, then I am salt. And as his follower, by choice, then I'm going to walk in what he has designed me to be. We go on into the next verse and read in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So I'm salt 
But outside of salt, um, lights. You know, something about light, as we are called to be. We are light because we draw light from the source, right? I'm not a light, I'm a lamp. I'm not the light, I'm the flashlight. I'm not the bulb, right? I am just the vessel. And we don't get the whole light because, because if God lit up the whole path and said, hey, Kimberly, here's how it's going to be, that I wouldn't have to walk by faith. And I know that walking by faith is part of my walk, it's part of my submission to the Almighty Father. But I am called to be a light to others. I am called to bring them alongside of me and show them the path and point them in the direction of the light. Point them into the way of the light. So I am salt, and I am light. So if I am called to be those two things, I am called to add flavor, maybe a little saucy for some of us. I'm called to create a thirst. I'm called to change what I touch. And then I'm called, once I have done those things, to go, but wait, not me, it's him. Because what I want to do is show other people this is what it looks like to be a father follower. This is what it looks like to love God so hard that people look at me and say, what's going on with her? And when they look at me and say that, I can say, you want some of that? Do you know my God? You want some of that? You know him? I tell my teams that all the, all the time at home at Cross Point. I say, just let people walk in the building, and if you do nothing else, nothing, just let them look at you and say, I want what she's got. And then when they ask, you point. That's it. So being a salt and being light, man, there's steps and there's things we can do. It, and it all seems so, so much, but really it's, it's just simple. Just be love to the people we are called to love. And when you fall short, and when you sin, and when you realize that, that you are not perfect, because you'll have those moments where you disqualify yourself. You remember, you remember that when you disqualify yourself, Jesus said, nah, uh, 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 not here. I handled that at the cross. That's not yours to carry anymore. And you turn away, and you walk in a way that you can lead others to the Father. Because here's the thing. If your disqualifications brought you down to a place where you couldn't lead others, then what does that say about the father you're pointing them towards? You show them that he can redeem you. You show them that he can move in your life. You show them that he has changed you in such a way that you cannot not tell others about it. And then you give him the glory for it. That is what it means to be the salt and the light. When we walk in a space where we understand that it's not about me, and Jesus says, it's not about you, it's how I see you. And I say, you are salt and you are light. We pray before we close, church. Father God, we thank you for today. God, thank you for this group of people that have come here to worship you so loud and with their whole heart. Thank you for being a father who created us, who walks with us and who leads us. God, if you say we are salt, this week we will walk out into a moment where we will behave accordingly. And when we trip and when we stumble and when we fall, we know that you are there to pick us up, to walk with us, or to carry us. And God, we pray that in our falls that the glory is yours in our redemption. We pray that when we stumble, that we point to you as the one who we are leaning and running after when we stand up. And God, when it's good, when it's good, God, let us not carry that ourselves either. Father, you have blessed us with lives of abundance. Allow us to walk in that space. Open our hearts, open our minds, and in our experiences and interactions this week, God, we just pray 
that you are there. And in each thing we do, each communication we have, each conversation, every moment, that your voice is louder. That no matter what society says, your voice is louder. No matter what the devil in my ear says, your voice is louder. So when people look at me, God, let them see you. Let them see your face, know your love, and know that authentic love and the river of life that th flows through me is not of me, but of you. We love you, Father. All glory, all honor, all praise is yours. We worship you this week with our lives, with our thoughts, with our actions, and we thank you for being a Father that pours out on us faithfully and endlessly. In your holy name we pray.